declares her friends are lying now. Excellency, Excellency, a moment. I think this goes to the heart of it. It surely does, Mr. Hale. I cannot say he is an honest man. I know him little. But in all justice, sir, a claim so weighty cannot be argued by a farmer. In God's name, sir, stop here. Send him home. Let him come again with the lawyer. Now, look you, Mr. Hale. Excellency, I assigned 72 death warrants. I am the minister of the Lord. And I dare not take a life without there be a proof so immaculate no slightest qualm of conscience may doubt it. Mr. Hale, you surely do not doubt my justice. I have this morning signed away the soul of Rebecca Nurse, Your Honor. I'm not concealed that my hand shakes yet as with a wound, I pray you, sir. This argument let lawyers present to you. Mr. Hale, believe me, for a man of such terrible learning, you are most bewildered. I hope you will forgive me. I have been 32 years at the bar, sir, and I should be confounded were I called upon to defend these people. Why don't you consider now, and I bet you all do like this. Top of 1198. In an ordinary crime, how does one defend the accused? One calls up the witness to prove his innocence. But witchcraft is ipso facto on its face, and by its nature an invisible crime, is it not? <laughs> Therefore, who may possibly be witness to it? The witch and the victim, none other. Now, we cannot hope the witch will accuse herself, grant it. Therefore, we must rely upon her victims, and they do testify the children, certain. No, but they testify. As for witches, none will deny that we are most eager for their confessions. Therefore, what is left for a lawyer to bring out? I think I have made my point, have I not? But this child believes the girls are not truthful. I, that is precisely what I am about to consider, sir. What more may you ask of me, unless you doubt my property? I surely do not, sir. Let you consider it, then. And let you put your heart to rest. Her deposition, Mr. Walker. Here you are, sir. I should like to question Sir, I bid you be silent. All right, let's pause for just a moment, and then we'll, we'll get right back into this. We just want to make sure that we are following closely the dynamic conflict and the tension involved here as we will, of course, show up to disrupt the court. And right away, we've got some interesting give and take that goes back and forth between even the people on the court itself. Mary Warren will say it out loud on page 1191. I, I was faking. It was pretense, sir. It's all, it's all made up. Notice Danforth will say on, uh, on page 1191, uh, Now, Mr. Proctor, before I decide whether I shall hear you or not, it is my duty to tell you this. We burn a hot fire here. It melts down all concealment. Of course, you understand the word picture. In other words, there's all this stuff that's kind of like a show, and we have a fire going here that's going to burn it all away. Of course, here is, for your notes, let's write this down, here is a, uh, the, the crucible, right? This is that whole notion of uh, a, a bowl or a container that allows you to heat up, for example, metals and blend them or whatever. The crucible now is set. Of course, we can kind of understand the word picture. This court is the crucible. And of course, we cannot miss this for our notes, that this is Arthur Miller's comments on McCarthy's Senate hearings. The idea is when you bring people in and you accuse them, and then you say, we need the names of other people as well. They are intimidated, they are frightened, and of course, this can't be considered true justice will be the argument. Notice Danforth will say at the bottom of 1191, there lurks nowhere in your heart nor hidden in your spirit any desire to undermine this court because obviously this is the, 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 the ultimate question. Why is Proctor actually here? The comment is made. Proctor tore up the, the warrant. And of course, you know, Proctor will defend himself by on page 1192 saying, it were a temper. I knew not what I did. Right? Um, Danforth will make the observation on 1192, I have seen marvels in this court. I've seen people choked before my eyes by spirits. He says, I have until this moment not the latest, the slightest reason to suspect the children may be deceiving me. In other words, he says it. There is absolutely no reason why all of these kids should be trying to deceive me. There must be something legitimate going on. Down uh, next line, Proctor says, Does it not strike upon you that so many of these women have lived so long with such upright reputation? We're back to the notion of that reputation. Then uh, the first of several bombshells regarding Elizabeth Proctor gets dropped on page 1193. Danforth will tell uh, Proctor, 
that his wife is pregnant. Well, in Puritan law, you can't hang a woman who is carrying a child. So even if she's found guilty of witchcraft, they're going to have to allow the child to be born before they can hang her. So in other words, you got basically a year is what he's told. So if you need your wife to be saved, she is saved. Are you ready to drop this accusation against the court? Proctor has to make the first of several major decisions in this third act, and this will be one of them. He kind of stands there and he thinks for a little bit, and then he decides, you know what? Bag it, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Why do you think he does that? Write that down. Why? His wife is now saved. Why didn't he just say, oh, okay, well, if my wife is safe for a year, then I'm good to go. I'm going to go ahead and walk out the door. Why does he say, yeah, no, I've still got to do this? Of course, the most obvious answer is he feels responsible, doesn't he? He's aware that all these people have been arrested because of him, the ripple effect, as we sometimes call it, right? Proctor says, I think I cannot then your purpose is somewhat larger. Notice Danforth says that the pure in heart need no lawyers. It's a, it's a dark irony at the bottom of 1193. 1194, we've got the list, right? We've got all kinds of names on the list. We wrote, we read about the, the blacklist uh, in the McCarthy era um, earlier, right? Danforth keeps saying, no one has anything to fear if they are good people. Of course, the, the irony is just dark here, right? I mean, all you got to do is be, is, is be named. We have a really compelling set of lines, though, in 1194. Let's look at them. Danforth will say, when Francis says, I brought trouble on these people, Danforth says, no, old man, you've not hurt these people if they are of good conscience. But you must understand, sir, that a person is either with this court or he must be counted against it. We're back to that idea that Arthur Miller presented in one of those essays um, earlier in the play where he said the danger of seeing the world in this really kind of bifurcated or bipolar way is that you're either with the court or you're against the court and that is the end of it. Notice he continues, there be no road between. In other words, there's no middle ground. You're either with this court or you're against this court. Of course, the problem is if you're against this court, what? Yeah, you are jack, soap on a rope and all of that, right? This is a sharp time now, a precise time. We live no longer in the dusky afternoon when evil mixed itself with good and befuddled the world. No, now by God's grace the shining sun is up and them that fear not light will surely praise it. Oh, I hope you'll be one of those. Wow. Note the compelling irony. Let's write it down. This is our focus in this third act is irony. The compelling irony. Danforth says no one has anything to fear as long as they are with the court. Well, of course, the obvious question here is, and we'll get to the, law, the faulty logic in a second. Well, what's the problem? Well, what if the court is wrong? We think, of course, of the McCarthy hearings. What if the court is wrong? What if the whole project is wrong? To stand up and say this is wrong is actually the right thing to do. Of course, it will be perceived as the wrong thing to do. Giles Jory will make on at the bottom of 1195 his attack against uh, Putnam by saying he's killing his neighbors for their land. I'm with you on 1196 now. Um, and the, the question again is, name the people, name the person who gave you the information about Putnam. If you don't give his name, you go to jail for contempt of court. If you do give his name, he goes to jail. Giles, notice, is in the middle of a nasty dilemma again. So let's write this down. We have this motif over and over again in this play where you've got this uh, choice that has to be made, and there's no easy way right, to do it. Notice the ironic line of Paris. The devil lives on such confidences. Right, um, um, hidden, hidden kinds of things. Notice he continues it. Without confidences, there could be no conspiracy. Of course, note the irony. Paris knows that Abigail and the girls were in the woods dancing around the fire. They, he knows that there probably was some witchcraft that they were involved with, and he will not bring it up. That is to say, he's hiding things. Eleven ninety-six at the bottom. Hale will say it, and we begin to see Hale's departure. Let's write this down. In the third act, 
Hale begins to look at all of this and say, something is fundamentally wrong with this project. And we begin to see it now in 1196. Hale will say it. We cannot blink it, we cannot blink it more. There is prodigious fear of this court in the country. Notice Danforth says, well, yeah, that's because there's so much guilt, right? He says it, Danforth, a few lines later. There's a moving plot to topple Christ in this country. Now, of course, th this line can be read on so many levels, but it also is somewhat of a mirroring line because earlier we had Paris, who also was of the same mindset that everybody in Salem is out to get me. Hale says, it does not follow that everyone accused is part of it. Danforth says, no uncorrupted man may fear this court. Notice how he keeps coming back to this idea again and again. Let's point out for your notes, and this will be one of the dark ironies of this play and one of the dark ironies of the McCarthy era. Danforth believes he's doing the right thing. Write that down. This is huge. Danforth believes he's doing the right thing. He believes that he has an obligation and he's doing the right thing. Dark irony. Proctor will come back now to say, Mary Warren says all of this is a lie. That she, in fact, is not legit. Hale wants to believe that this kind of information should not be presented simply by a farmer, as he calls Proctor, but there needs to be some kind of lawyer. Notice, he will say it at the bottom of 1197, I have signed 72 death warrants, I'm a minister of the Lord, and I dare not take a life without there be proof so immaculate, so slight as qualm of conscience may doubt it. Hale is in a serious dilemma then. He says, I want to have a conscience as I condemn all these people to death. And of course, you cannot condemn all these people to death without having some problems when obviously you've got the kinds of dynamics at play on the ground here that we've got, right? He will even say it. Rebecca Nurse is signed to this morning, signed by him to hang as a, uh, as, as a witch. And then he confronts Danforth, and this will be the last time, of course, that Hale and Danforth will get on. He says, um, uh, Danforth makes the observation, the only way to find out whether a person is guilty of being a witch is to ask the victim, because obviously the witch is not going to, uh, is not going to admit it. And of course, in this point now, for your notes, we have this faulty logic at play, right? Because he makes the difference between uh, the ordinary crime, and then, of course, this whole witchcraft thing. It's, it, it, it's, it, it's both facto on its face and by its nature. Witchcraft is an invisible crime, is it not? Therefore, who may possibly be witness to it? The witch and the victim, none other. Now, we cannot hope that the witch will accuse herself. Granted, therefore, we must rely upon her victims. And they do testify. The children certainly do testify. Uh, we'll now have, of course, this uh, the end of the uh, the end of uh, of the act. Before we get there, though, let's go ahead on 1199. Just read with me for a second your world literature connection, political drama. This is Federico Garza Lorca. Um, the dates here are 1898 to 1936. Playwright, just read with me. Playwright and poet Federico Garza Lorca was born in a village in southern Spain, a region that had changed little since the Middle Ages. For centuries, the land had been owned by the wealthy and, and tiled. Uh, and, and tilled by uh, peasants. As a child, Lorca entertained his family by performing puppet shows. He grew up to write plays that were unique in the Spanish tradition. They were simple and elemental, poetic and powerful. They spoke of the suffering of people who were not free to express themselves. In 1931, Spain elected a democratic government and it seemed a freer era had dawned. However, Spain was fiercely divided. In May of 1936, Lorca completed his last play, The House of Bernarda Alba, about a tyrannical widow who keeps her five daughters locked in the house. Two months later, before the play could be performed, civil war erupted. Lorca, along with thousands of others, was murdered by fascists. His plays were banned in Spain for many years. And then you connect to literature, speculate about why a government might prevent the performance of a play. We might obviously think about the significance of that as it relates to uh, this text. Now, we're going to have a couple of things that are coming. Let's set it up. Danforth is going to ask a simple question to Mary Warren. Watch it. So you said you were faking before when, for example, you fell down on the ground and acted like you were possessed by a spirit and you turned cold. Do it now then. If you were faking then, surely you can fake now. Do it. 
Mary Warren will have to admit, I cannot do it. Abigail Williams will see her, op her opportunity. She will step in. She will take that opportunity, and we'll watch how things unfold. I'm with you now on 1199 and following. All right, so let's pay attention. Here we go. Mr. Chiba, will you go into the court and bring the children here? Yes, sir. Mary Warren, how come you to this turnabout? Has Mr. Proctor threatened you? I'm on 1,200. Has he ever threatened you? No, sir. Has he threatened you? No. Then you tell me that you sat in my court callously lying. Answer me. I did. How were you instructed in your life? Do you not know that God damns all liars? Or is it now that you lie? No, sir. I am with God You now. are with God now. Yes, sir. I'll tell you this. You are either lying now or you were lying in the court, and in either case you have committed perjury and you will go to jail for it. You cannot likely say you lied, Mary. Do you know that? I cannot lie no more. I'm with God. I am with God. Here are the girls, sir. Susanna Walcott, Mercy Lewis, Betty Paris, and Abigail Williams. Ruth Putnam is not in the court, sir, nor the other children. This will be sufficient. Sit you down, children. Your friend, Mary Warren, has given us a deposition in which she swears that she never saw familiar spirits, apparitions, nor any manifest of the devil. She claims as well that none of you have seen these things either. Now, children, this is a court of law. The law based upon the Bible and the Bible writ by Almighty God forbid the practice of witchcraft and describe death as the penalty thereof. But, likewise, children, the law and Bible damn all bearers of false witness. All liars. Now then, it does not escape me that this deposition may be devised to blind us. It may well be that Mary Warren has been conquered by Satan who sends her here to distract our sacred purpose. If so, her neck will break for it. But if she's been true, I bid you now drop your guile and confess your pretense, for a quick confession will go easier with you. Abigail Williams, rise. Is there any truth in this? No, sir. But children, a very awkward bit will now be turned into your souls until your honesty is proved. Will either of you change your positions now, or do you force me to hard questioning? I have not to change, sir. She lies. Oh, no. You would still go on with this, Mary Warren? On top of 1201. A puppet was discovered in Mr. Proctor's house, stabbed by a needle. Mary Warren claims that you sat beside her in the court when she made it, and that you saw her make it, and witnessed how she herself stuck her needle into it for safekeeping. What say you to that? It is a lie, sir. Why did you work for Mr. Proctor? Did you see puppets in that house? Goody Proctor always kept puppets. Your Honor, my wife never kept no puppets. Mary Warren confesses it were her puppet. Mr. Danforth, what profit this girl to turn herself about? What may Mary Warren gain but hard questioning and words? You are charging Abigail Williams with a marvellous cool plot to murder. Do you understand that? I do, sir. I believe she means to murder. This child would murder your wife. It is not a child. Now hear me, sir. In the sight of the congregation, she were twice this year put out of the meeting house for laughter during what prayer. What's laughter during? Your Excellency, she were under titular's power at that time, but she is solemn now. Why, she is solemn and goes to hang. Quiet, man. Surely it have no bearing on the question, sir. He charges contemplation of murder. I... 12 or 2. Mary. Now, tell the governor how you danced in the woods. Excellency, since I come to see them, this man is blackening my name. Moment, sir. What is this dancing? Mr. Proctor. If Abigail leads the girls to the woods. Your Honor, they have danced their naked. Oh, Your Honor, this is... Mr. Paris discovered them himself in the dead of night. There's the child she is. Mr. Paris. Poor Mr. Paris. I, I never found any of them naked, and this but man is... discovered them dancing in the woods. Excellency. When I first arrived from Beverly, Mr. Paris told me that. Do you deny it, Mr. Paris? I do not, sir, but I never saw any of them. Maybe. But she had danced. I, sir. Excellency, will you permit me? 1203. Proceed. You say you never saw no spirits, Mary? Were never threatened or afflicted by any manifest of the devil or the devil's agents? And yet, when people accused of witchery confronted you in court, you would faint? saying their spirits came out of their bodies and choked you. Oh, pretense. I cannot hear you. Pretense. But you did turn cold, did you not? I myself picked you up many times and your skin were icy. Mr. Danforth, I saw you that many times. She only pretended to faint, Your Excellency. They're all marvelous pretenders. Then can she pretend to faint now? 
Why not? No. There are no spirits attacking her, for none in this room is accused of witchcraft. So let her turn herself cold now. Let her pretend she is attacked now. Let her faint. Faint. I faint. Prove to us that you pretended in the court so many times. I cannot faint now, sir. Can you not pretend it? Why, Mrs. Lucky, now, I, I, might it be I, that here we have no afflicted spirit loose but in the court there I were some? No then see no spirits now and prove to us that you can faint by your own will as you I, claim. I cannot do it. Oh, then you will confess, will you not? It were attacking spirits made you faint. No, sir. Oh, well, well, why? This is a trick to blind the court. It's not a trick. I used to faint because I, I thought I saw spirits. Thought you saw them? I did not, Your Honor. How could you think you saw them unless you saw them? I, I cannot tell how, but I did. I heard the other girls screaming. You, you, Your Honor, you seem to believe them. And I, it for all this part in the beginning, sir. And then the whole world cried, spirits, spirits. And I promise you, Mr. Danforth, I only thought I saw them, but I did not. Oh, I, surely Your Excellency is not taken in by this simple lie. Abigail, I... I bid you now search your heart and tell me this and beware of it, child. To God, every soul is precious and his vengeance is terrible on them that take life without cause. Is it possible, child, that the spirits you have seen are illusion only, some deception that may cross your mind? This is a base question, sir. Child, I would have you consider it. I have been hurt, Mr. Danforth. I have seen my blood running out. I have been near to murdered every day because I done my duty pointing out the devil's people. And this is my reward. To be mistrusted, child, denied, questioned, and let you, you beware, Mr. Danforth. Think you to be so mighty that the power of hell may not turn your wits. Beware of it. There is... What is it, child? Watch this. I'm not. <laughs> 